Coming up on a newscast. North Korea fired three ballistic missiles toward the East Sea in response to the first such provocation since the start of the Union administration. South's top office strongly condemns the launch. Yoon sung hyuk presided over his first cabinet meeting at his office in Yongsan. An extra budget bill that will largely be spent on helping businesses hit by the pandemic is passed. Ukrainian troops reportedly pushed Russian forces back near Kharkiv. The country also offered to release Russian prisoners in exchange for the evacuation of Ukrainian soldiers in Azovstal. Hello and welcome to our newscast. I'm Daniel Che. Let's begin with our top story. Just a few hours ago, North Korea fired three ballistic missiles toward the East Sea. This marks the regime's 16th provocation of the year, the first since the launch of the UN administration. Baeunji starts us off. At about 6.30 p.m. on Thursday, the South Korean military said North Korea launched a total of three short-range ballistic missiles toward the East Sea. Seoul's Joint Chiefs of Staff said they were fired from the North Sunan area in its capital city of Pyongyang. That's the same area where the North on March 24 conducted its first full ICBM test since 2017. The military said the missiles flew about 360 kilometers at an altitude of around 90 kilometers. The latest launch reportedly involved a multiple rocket launcher, and it's the first time that the North has ever test-fired three missiles consecutively. This comes just three days after the newly inaugurated President Yoon suk yeol took office on Tuesday. It also comes after the South Korean military said earlier in the day that it has now decided to use the word missile and officially classify it as a provocation rather than just a threat. This is in line with the new administration's promise that it will deal sternly with provocations from North Korea. North Korea's series of missile launches recently are serious provocations that pose a threat to the Korean Peninsula, as well as international peace and security. We strongly urge the North to immediately put a halt to its actions. In fact, on Thursday, in a text message to reporters right after the launch, the military wrote that the North fired a ballistic missile. Normally, the military would use the word projectile instead. Following the launch, the presidential office convened a meeting of its National Security Council, where they condemned the North's actions. It also said the government would take practical and stern measures against the provocation. Seoul's ambassador to the United Nations also condemned Pyongyang's recent missile test during a Security Council meeting in New York on Wednesday and urged the North to commit to complete, verifiable and irreversible denuclearization. The phrase, often abbreviated as CVID, marks a shift in tone in South Korea's policy towards North Korea. Peunji, Arirang News. After claiming to have had zero COVID-19 cases today, North Korea reported its first infection. According to the regime's state-run media, Kim Jong-un held an emergency meeting and ordered a nationwide lockdown. Cho Sang-min has the full story. Nearly two and a half years since the COVID-19 pandemic swept across the world, North Korea on Thursday reported its first case of the virus. Calling the situation a major national emergency, the North's state-run news agency KCNA said there was a hole in its emergency quarantine procedures that had kept the regime safe until that point. It said that the DNA samples collected by authorities from patients with fevers in Pyongyang were identical to Omicron. The KCNA said its leader Kim Jong-un chaired a Workers' Party meeting on Thursday to discuss the regime's response to the first outbreak of the virus. Video footage from the North's state-run Korean Central Television showed Kim walking into the meeting room while wearing a mask for the first time. Kim ordered all cities to undergo strict lockdowns and said emergency reserve medical supplies would be mobilized. Although North Korea's state media did not provide further details on case numbers or possible sources of infection, one expert says Omicron may have already spread to a lot of people in North Korea. The fact that the North convened an emergency polybro meeting indicates that there is a possibility a lot of people have already been infected, not just a few. Seoul's Unification Ministry said Thursday that the South Korean government is willing to provide medical aid to North Korea based on humanitarian considerations. To prevent COVID-19 from entering, North Korea had closed its borders to nearly all trade and visitors for more than two years, which further shocked an already damaged economy. Up until now, the North had never confirmed a single COVID-19 infection and had declined offers of shipments of vaccines from the COVAX Global COVID-19 Vaccine Sharing Program. Cho Sung-min, Arirang News. 
The government endorsed an extra budget proposal, a record high of $46 billion for pandemic-hit businesses. Yoon Jung-min has more from the first cabinet meeting held in the new presidential office. This is how President Yoon Song Yeol kicked off his very first cabinet meeting at the new presidential office in Yongsan Thursday afternoon. 국무회의는 헌법이 정하고 있는 중요한 국정 심의 기구입니다. 저는 이 국무회의가 주요 안건을 통과시키는 회의체가 아니라 국정 현안에 대해 우리 위원 국무위원 여러분들의 다양한 의견이 오고 가는 그런 자리가 되었으면 합니다. But Yoon and his cabinet did approve a key agenda during their first extraordinary meeting, a record 46 billion U.S. dollar extra budget proposal designed to provide compensation to small businesses hit hardest by the pandemic. 지금 당장 급한 불을 끄지 않는다면 향후 더큰 복지 비용으로 재전 건전성을 흔들 수 있기 때문에 어려운 분들에게 적시에 the president also stressed the need to stabilize prices as well as people's livelihoods. The top office says coming just two days after inauguration, the extraordinary session demonstrates the new leader's commitment to take the financial burden off of those who've suffered the most due to antivirus business restrictions. Present at Yoon's first cabinet meeting were two members of the previous Moon Jae-in government, Land Minister Do Hyung-wook and Health Minister Kwon dok to meet the quorum. Although the full cabinet hasn't been appointed, we were able to make a swift decision on the basis of pragmatism and with the help of cabinet members from the previous administration. The presidential office urged for prompt passage of the bill at the National Assembly. The president will deliver a speech on the bill to Parliament next Monday. Yoon Jung-min, Arirang News. The UN administration's first supplementary budget focused on helping those hit hardest by the pandemic. It will also be used to help cushion the impact of surging consumer prices and to strengthen preventive measures against epidemics. Am um Ji-young explains further. One of the most important promises of President Yoon Seok-yeol providing relief to small businesses hit by the pandemic is the centerpiece of the extra budget. Finance Minister Chu kyung ho on Thursday announced the details of the second supplementary budget of the year worth a record 46 billion U.S. dollars. 28 billion dollars of the budget as a whole will be spent directly by the central government, while the other 18 billion will be handed over to regional governments. Of the roughly 36.4 trillion won, more than 70 percent of it will go to help small businesses hit by the pandemic, covering all of their losses. He said each business that's had a drop in revenue because of social distancing will get up to 10 million won, or roughly $7,800. He added that the government plans to improve the compensation scheme so that losses can be fully covered. Around $2 billion will be used to provide loans and debt relief to small business owners and help them get back on their feet. Another big slice of around $4.7 billion will also be spent on strengthening preventive measures against COVID-19 and other diseases. This will include medical expenses and additional supplies of COVID-19 pills. Also, the government will allocate $2.4 billion for stabilizing consumer prices and people's livelihoods. Up to $7,800 will be given to some 2.2 million low-income households to support their purchasing power. Chu emphasized that the main source of the funds will be tax surpluses rather than debt. He said around $16.5 billion had been drawn from the expected tax surplus this year, and $11.4 billion is from other surplus resources and adjustments to government spending. Financing the extra budget without issuing government bonds will minimize the impact on the economy, 
including interest rates and prices. The debt-to-GDP ratio is expected to improve to 49.6% from 50.1%. He added that this year's surplus tax is expected to amount to some $41 billion, resulting mostly from a $23 billion rise in corporate tax revenue led by last year's earning surprise in the semiconductor and finance sectors. The government is to use around $7 billion of the supplementary budget to reduce the government's debt. Om ji Arirang News. President Yoon added SME's Minister Yi Young and Industry Minister Yi Chang Yang to his cabinet. That's four new names added on this Thursday. Kim Young sung tells us more. Day three since President Yoon suk yeol took office, and already more than half of his cabinet seats have been filled. The latest additions were made Thursday evening, SME's Minister Yi Young and Industry Minister Yi Chang Yang. Four cabinet seats were filled on Thursday alone, with Foreign and Interior Ministers Park Jin and Lee Sang-min added to the team earlier in the day. But some say that Yoon is rushing to fill his cabinet. Yoon's decision to appoint Park Jin and Lee Sang-min as ministers has especially stoked criticism, as Yoon decided to push ahead with the appointments despite the delay in the National Assembly's approval. Considering the time it took for past administrations to complete their starting cabinets, Yoon is moving at a faster pace to fill his. Some speculate that the rush was connected to Yoon's first cabinet meeting on Thursday. The meeting discussed an item that Yoon had time and time again stressed was urgent, the extra budget bill for pandemic-battered businesses. And to convene, Yoon needed a minimum of 11 people present. With freshly appointed ministers Park Jin and Lee Sang-min and two ministers from the Moon Jae-in administration joining the meeting, Yoon had just made it above the cut, with 12 attendees. SME's Minister Lee Young and Industry Minister Lee Chang-yang were not present, as their appointments had been made after the meeting took place. An official at the presidential office said on Thursday that the administration is mainly focusing on continuing state affairs without any hold-ups as the country is trudging through difficult economic times and as it has two monumental events, U.S.-South Korea summit and the local elections, coming up. But appointing a new prime minister may need more time, as the ruling and the opposition parties remain at a contentious gridlock over the Yunpik nominee Han Dok soo Kim Hyun-sung, Arirang News. Moving on to other stories now, South Koreans will head to the polls again to choose new mayors, governors and councils this time. There are also several big by-elections for the National Assembly. Kim Do-yeon provides a glimpse of what to expect in June. Things are heating up again already on the country's political scene, with nationwide local elections on the horizon. On Thursday, candidates officially registered for the June 1st local elections. Most voters across South Korea will be voting in seven different elections. These include the chief of their province or metropolitan city, education superintendents, their mayors, city council members, constituency council members, as well as the proportional representatives of these districts. The official campaigning period begins on the 19th of this month and will be the first nationwide election since the start of President Yoon's term and it could have an impact on what happens during it. The Democratic Party of Korea will win votes by using its entire capacity to responsibly keep the Yoon administration in check while presenting fair alternatives. Let's pay extra attention to ensure that the party's campaign pledges, as well as the national agenda designed by the Presidential Transition Committee, are well reflected in the process of the local elections. The capital region for this election is again a key battleground with the race for the mayor of Seoul between former chairman of the Democratic Party of Korea's Hong Young-gil and the incumbent mayor Oh Se-hun from the People Power Party. For the governor of Gyeonggi-do province, former presidential candidate Kim Dong-yeon from the DP and former lawmaker and president news spokesperson Kim Eun-hye face off. Running concurrently with local elections will be by-elections with even bigger names on the ballot to fill the vacancies caused by National Assembly members running for other posts. Racing to vacancy in Incheon City left by Song will be Lee Jae-myung himself, 
facing off against the PPP's Yoon hyung Sun, a local to rival a big-name politician who doesn't have any ties to the area. For the vacancy caused by Kim in Seongnam City, former presidential candidate and Yoon's transition committee chairman An Cheol Su will try to keep the district red, going against the DP's candidate Kim byung both with software industry backgrounds and for a district that's home to many Korean IT firms. This will be the third major election during the COVID-19 pandemic. While no major information has been given in terms of virus prevention measures and how to accommodate infected people who wish to vote, the new administration is slated to alter the current virus measures toward the end of May. Kim Do-yeon, Arirang News. Ukrainian troops reportedly pushed Russian forces back in the northeastern city of Kharkiv. Ukraine also offered to release Russian prisoners in exchange for the evacuation of Ukrainian soldiers in Azovstal steel plant. Yishu has the latest. Ukrainian troops have reportedly pushed Russian forces back in the northeastern city of Kharkiv. That's according to the BBC on Thursday, which reports that Russian artillery are no longer in range of the city center. However, it cannot be seen as a full-blown retreat. Instead, they are believed to be waiting for reinforcements from several battalion tactical groups. Previously, Ukraine had stopped Russian forces from crossing the Seversky Donets River in the Luhansk region. The Ukrainians blew up two pontoon bridges in the region on Tuesday, stopping Russian troops from crossing. Meanwhile, Ukraine has offered to release Russian prisoners in exchange for the evacuation of injured Ukrainian soldiers from the besieged Azovstal steel plant in Mariupol. That's according to the Ukrainian Deputy Prime Minister Irina Vershchuk on Wednesday. Vershchuk posted on social media that while there is no agreement in place at the moment, negotiations are underway. Ukrainian military commander Captain Subyatoslav Palomar, who's currently inside the Azovstal steel plant, told CNN on Wednesday that he believes all civilians who are sheltering inside the plant are now out. However, he added that it is difficult to make a full assessment of the situation due to the sheer size of the plant itself. Previously on Saturday, President Zelensky said that women, children and the elderly had exited the plant as part of Phase 1. Zelensky also said that phase two would be for the injured medics and soldiers inside the plant. Meanwhile, Finland has recently announced it's in favor of applying to join NATO. While steps remain before the application process can begin, it has wide support from other NATO members. Sweden is also expected to announce its intention to join the alliance in the coming days. In response, Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov said that Finland has joined the unfriendly steps taken by the European Union towards Russia. When asked what response Russia would take, Peskov said that it would depend on the extent to which the NATO expansion plays out. Russia has warned both countries against joining NATO, saying there would be consequences. Yi Si-hu, Arirang News. Moscow imposed sanctions on gas from Germania, the German unit of the Russian gas producer supplies much of its gas to Europe, so the countries that impose sanctions on Russia will likely be affected. Gazprom gave up ownership of the firm's German operations last month without explanation. Since then, Germany's energy network regulator took control. In response to the sanction, the country's economy minister said Russia is using its energy exports as a weapon. Back here in the nation, tours of Cheongade will be held until June 11th. After opening the former presidential compound to the public on Tuesday, the new top office announced the tours, originally scheduled to end on May 22nd, will be extended. Reservations for the extended period began via online platforms, including Naver, Kakao, or Toss. The Korean version of the website shows visitors must book at least nine days ahead of their desired tour date. The Blue House will be open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., accepting up to 39,000 guests per day. As of Thursday, there have been 2,312,740 applicants. Seoul will expand its benefits for multicultural families. That includes adding more interpreters for expecting mothers at the hospital and more child care services. The city government is going to hire 10 more interpreters to help women getting their checkups. Currently, there are 25 of them. It's also going to be 
It's going to build five more multicultural family support centers, rather, which provide child care. There's only one right now. The plan is to do all of this by the end of the year. As for job seekers, the city will also hold lectures and consulting sessions as well. There was a time when university students could gather at the grassy areas on campus to socialize and enjoy a bit of freedom. Due to the pandemic, all college events and festivals were either canceled altogether or went online. Now, they are back. Kim bo Young follows this report. The unrelenting pandemic had taken the highly anticipated campus life away from new university students. But now, with social distancing measures lifted, college festivals have returned. Major universities in South Korea are already busy planning their festival schedules, and among them is Seoul National University, which came up with the homecoming festival. The once quiet campus field is now filled with students enjoying the festival that is back in full and in person for the first time in three years. A variety of booths, food trucks and activities add to the festive atmosphere. One of the organizers says the festival wanted to welcome those who felt the effects of the pandemic the most, the classes of 2020 and 2021, as if they are coming back home. I believe a good festival helps students connect, makes them talk about the festival they enjoyed even years later. The main purpose is to let them bond and make new memories together. The festival seemed to do what it set out to, letting students really feel like they're on a university campus, making new friends. I got in last year but could hardly come to campus because of COVID-19. It's hard to imagine that we are actually having a festival here. Now I feel like a real college student. Yeah, I think it's our first time and I think it's super fun. The weather is super nice today and it's very nice to be outside, not how to wear a mask anymore and just enjoy the vibes, yeah. People who were in the year above me at high school told me that going to college wouldn't be anything special, so I was worried about being disappointed. But now we're having festivals and can meet many new friends. I feel so happy. University festivals being back and at full capacity has been welcomed by the vendors too. We went through such a tough period due to the virus, so having festivals like this gives us a lot of hope. Other major universities are also working out their festival plans to give students a place they can meet new people in person instead of on Zoom. Kim bo Arirang News. Those across western regions will see another day of early summer-like heat. Highs will be warmer than the seasonal norms, near 25 degrees Celsius, and that also includes the capital region. But the east coast will be breezy again tomorrow, with the mercury staying under 20 degrees. There is quite unstable across the east. The unstable atmospheric conditions will lead to light showers for the east and Jeju Island. Parts of Gangwon-do and Gyeongsang-do provinces will see 5 millimeters of rainfall. Jeju Island will see about 5 to 20 millimeters. After the rain, we can expect temperatures to cool down. Under cloudy skies, morning lows will range from 13 to 18 degrees Celsius. Seoul and Daejeon will start off at 16 degrees. Daytime highs will be 2 to 4 degrees lower than today. Seoul and Daejeon will get up to 25 degrees. Chuncheon 21, Gyeongju and Busan will be breezy at 19 degrees. Starting tomorrow night, a surge of cold air mass will filter into the nation. This weekend is forecast to be sunny with breezy temperatures. That's all for now, and here are the weather conditions around the world.
time to wrap things up. As always, thank you for staying with us.